my name is Ben Murphy. I'm not your speaker today. Um, I'm the Chief Security Officer, the U.S. Chief Security Officer for AFLAC, the Duck. Sorry, for AFLAC, the Duck. I'm not going to do any quacking. I'm not going to do any imitations. There's actually all kinds of rules about what you can and cannot do regarding the Duck. Where he can be on the page, if anything can be near him, what he's allowed to say. There's all kinds of rules. And I'll let you guys in on a secret. This is supposed to be an internal company secret. I'm not making this up. I'm not supposed to tell people this, but since you were kind enough to come, I'll let you know the Duck has a name. He has an official name. Uh, it's only documented internally, but uh, his official name is The Duck. <laughs> so, a bit of trivia, if anyone ever asks you what The Duck's name is, that's actually documented, documented internally, his name is The Duck. Capital T, uh, Capital T, Capital D, yeah. Uh, there actually is a duck. Um, he lives in Columbus, Georgia. He's trained to smile for uh, cell phone pictures. If you point your phone at him, he'll do that. Um, he, he lives a pretty good life, though. He has his own little lake that he lives on. Uh, so anyway, um, we rented the room, which is why I'm taking up some of Dan's time uh, to do an introduction, but I'll make it quick. Um, your speaker today is Dan Sterling. Uh, Dan has a wealth of experience, uh, 15 years doing direct financial and strategy management for a range of companies from startups to half a billion in revenue. He's got another 10 years of experience as a consultant for domestic and international companies, some of the largest companies in the world, uh, in every regulated or critical infrastructure industry that you can imagine. Uh, and so he's got um, quite a bit of experience both doing it and showing others how to do it uh, across many different industries and management strategies. And he's here today to talk to you about disruption and whether you want to make it happen or wait for someone else to do it to you. Uh, so, without any more wasted time, I'm going to turn it over to Dan. Hey, thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Oh, that's fine. Oh, there we go. So, topic this morning is technology-driven business model disruption. And if you were to ask me about technology versus business models, you probably know more about the technology side than I do. So, I'm going to focus mostly on business models. So we're going to talk briefly about the technologies that are going to disrupt business models. I'm going to highlight some of the reasons that traditional approaches to change analysis, strategic planning uh, are failing, have failed, will fail. I'm going to give you some scenarios and some examples, not that they're going to come true, but give you some ideas um, for what might happen and what the implications are. And then we're going to wrap with um, some talk about how you disrupt your business model. If you made the keynote this morning, uh, 50 to 75 percent of the key points um, are going to be emphasized in this session because Duncan talked about a lot of the things that you need to do um, and I'll try to fill in some of the blanks with some specifics um, but tried and true methods. So let's start with technologies. No surprise on the technologies that are going to be disruptive. So you've got um, Internet of Things collecting data from sensors. You've got edge computing uh, transforming that data, analyzing it at the source, whether it be at a car or on a piece of farm equipment or whatever. Uh, you've got 5G increasing the communication. Uh, Duncan talked quite a bit this morning about 3D printing, um, augmented reality. So all should be familiar terms and you can learn more about any of these technologies by Googling them than you can by listening to me. So what do these, what do these technologies need in order to be disruptive from a business model perspective? They need two things. They need lots and lots of data and lots and lots of compute. So you can imagine what my next two slides are. Number one, data. So back up one for me, thanks. So I used to think that I was a watching data today. I, you know, you've got Siri, you've got Alexa, you know, your car talks to you, you've got your cell phone, you've got computers. They say that today there are 47 zettabytes of data available. I didn't even know what a zettabyte was. It's a billion terabytes. And what's interesting to me about that is a few years ago I was director of artificial intelligence for a company called Teradata and Teradata named itself Teradata because they wanted to be the company that could manage a terabyte of data and be the only one that could do it and actually they're really good at managing lots and lots of data but that just tells you how fast data is growing and they project by 2035 40 to 50 times more data is going to be available so checkbox plenty of data for transformation so on the technology side, if you've done any research about compute 
whether it be with Intel or AMD or NVIDIA, you'll hear a lot of things about Moore's Law is dead, compute's not keeping up, um, you know, all sorts of statements like that. Um, it's, it's basically not true. I mean, it's true and it's not true. So they're having more trouble putting as many transistors on chips and getting the same compute um, the way they've done in the past. But the way they've gotten around that is they're now designing chips for specific purposes. And I'm going to show you an example of a chip that's in a Tesla uh, that's 21 times faster than the NVIDIA chip that it replaced three years prior. Um, getting 21 times compute in three years is vastly faster than Moore's Law. So I would, I would subscribe that, yes, Moore's Law from a traditional perspective might be dead, but they're working their way around it by designing chips for specific purposes. So you combine the data with the technologies, and they're not additive. They don't complement each other. I, I say here they're multiplicative. So in the concept of self-driving cars, you've got Internet of Things being the sensors on the car. You've got edge computers where the computers are going to make decisions at the wheel. They're going to make decisions at different components in the car. Then that data is going to be aggregated into a computer in the car, which is also edge computing. Then that car will communicate with other cars around it it will communicate with other data sources, right? That's your 5G. And of course, what's driving all of it and what's making all the decisions? Artificial intelligence. So what you really have to worry about when you think about your business is not each individual technology, but how they all work together. The second message on this slide is on the right. That is a chip. And the name on that chip is not Intel. The name on that chip is not AMD. It's not Nvidia, it's Tesla, okay? Tesla designed this chip. And in a few minutes when we're talking about what you do for business model disruption, I'm going to tell you why that matters. Um, the message in this section is that that chip was 21 times faster than the chip that preceded it, at, and it was 80% cheaper. So. <clears throat> Failing traditional approaches. So since 1955, 88% of the Fortune 500 are gone. And I know 1955 was a long time ago. So we pulled another data point for you. Since 1995, so in the last 25 years, the average lifespan of a company in the Fortune 500 has been cut in half from 30 years to 15 years. The pace of disruptive uh, business models, disruptive technologies is accelerating. Um, and I put on here, despite hiring the best and the brightest, all these companies that are gone, they all hire, hired the Harvard MBAs, they all hired the best consulting firms, they all hired the best Wall Street banks, they did everything you're supposed to do and yet they're gone, they're declining, things aren't working. So why is that? <clears throat> so each of these pictures kind of represents what's wrong with the traditional approaches to strategic planning. I'm going to walk through a couple of them, but I'm, for time purposes, I'm not going to hit on all of them. Uh, everyone should have a copy of the article on their chair, and if not, we'll be handing them out afterwards so you can read about these. Um, the Rolex watch represents ex exclusivity. Strategy is done by strategists. Strategy is ivory tower. Strategy is done by those smart people we hire. They do it every five years. We revise it every two to three years. We do quarterly planning, right? Exclusivity doesn't work in eras of disruption. Um, let's do certainty. So people do a strategy and they think it works. You've got the data in front of you. You've done the analytics. You know what the customer segments are. You know how those segments have changed because some big consulting firm told you. Um, you think you're certain, and people tend to go to sleep. We've done the strategy, now it's time to execute. You do your strategy, then you execute. You do your planning, then you execute. These things cannot be separated to be successful in the future. It has to be organic, it has to be ongoing. You have to be prepared to learn and fail and achieve and repeat the loop over and over and over again. There's a lot of lessons that I can talk about from the Amazon slide, um, and there's a lot you can read about it, but the one I'm, I want to highlight on is this bottom line here, which is their net income over the years. That, my friends, is the definition of patient capital. How long did Amazon go? How long did we read, right, about how Amazon's growing, but they don't make any money? Hey, they lost more money last quarter. As a percentage, their gross margin was more negative than it was the last time. Um, if you're making decisions on a quarterly basis, and the people that are trying to destroy your industry have patient capital like that. Um, as Duncan said uh, this morning, you know, you might make it for a few quarters, you might get some good bonuses, but you're gonna lose your business. 
Um, trying to think of the source of this slide. I'm, I'm drawing a blank. Gartner. Gartner has a couple good slides on, on innovation. I've included two of them here about why traditional, um, traditional approaches fail. Um, down at the bottom, they're kind of listed. So the voice of the customer, incrementalism, keeping up with competitors, the, the quarterly pull to Wall Street, meeting your compensation targets, um, all reward incrementalism. They don't reward um, thinking about big bets. So what you've got to do is you've got to carve out a percentage of your investment, whether it be R&D, whether it be new product development, whether it be strategy, market research. It's got to be focused on something more than the next quarter. Uh, balanced scorecards. Balanced scorecards are not a bad thing. Uh, Duncan this morning talked about expansiveness versus um, constraint, right? And if you've got a business model that's working and you want to optimize it, there's a lot of tools that are very good about optimizing, um, and balanced scorecards are one of them. But a balanced scorecard approach is going to lead to getting more of the same. So if the same is working and that's what you want, you use it. But you can't use balanced scorecards for looking at technology disruption. So we're going to go through some, some scenarios. And the first one I want to talk about is self-driving cars. And there's, there's any number of scenarios about how self-driving cars are going to play out. I'm going to focus on four of them. If you go ahead and put all four of them on there. Um, so the first scenario is that self-driving cars don't take off for regulatory reasons. They're never approved. They're unsafe. Um, people just, you know, they're either not approved re for regulatory reasons or people perceive them to be dangerous. And so they never, they never go anywhere. The second scenario, maybe um, self-driving cars work, but they're luxury items. They're too expensive. Um, and so only the, the privileged few uh, get to use them. The third scenario is that self-driving cars are widely adopted but they're owned in the method that they're owned today. So if you're a family of four and you have 2.3 kids and 2.3 cars, you know, 15 years from now, you're going to have 2.3 kids and 2.3 cars. The scenario I'm going to focus on is the disruptive scenario. Okay? And the disruptive scenario says um, that as self-driving cars are adopted, um, people are going to stop owning cars and they're going to start subscribing to networks. Um, if you look at any number of things today, the average age that teenagers start driving, um, all sorts of other factors, this scenario has some legs. Um, not saying that it's definitely going to happen, but I'm saying that there's a probability around it. That probability has implications, and your industry probably needs to be focused on it. So there's, there's four primary reasons that I think this scenario has legs. I'm going to focus on mostly on the first two. So from a consumer economics perspective, you read all the time about the shrinking middle class, about the challenges the middle class has with paying for college, for paying for all sorts of things. Um, the average car loan has extended from used to be two to three to four years. Now the average car loan is almost seven years. Um, consumers, if faced with an opportunity to significantly impact their budget, are going to move away from current traditional models. Um, most of the models that I've seen suggest that a consumer can save an average of $500 a month for every car that they stop buying. And, you know, if you, if you read the literature, they say the average family couldn't survive a $400 emergency. They'd have trouble coming up with the money. They'd have to borrow from family or friends. So if you're in that situation and you can't survive a $400 emergency, how appealing would it be to save $500 a month? Okay? Another scenario, aging parents. You know, everyone, you know, I've had to have the conversation a couple times. Nobody wants to take mom and dad's keys. A self-driving car is an opportunity to not take the keys and give them the freedom, right? But you don't necessarily want to pay, you know, $2,000 a month for insurance and gas or electricity and the finance payment and everything else. But if they can subscribe to it, you can give them the freedom um, but while keeping everyone safe. So there's direct and indirect impacts. If people move away from owning individual cars, and let's just say not everyone does, right? Let's say, for argument's sake, 20% of the cars go from being owned by individuals to be owned by networks, okay? Well, first of all, it's projected that these networks are going to be 40% more efficient in their use of cars than people are today. Well, why is that? Well, I'll use myself as an example. I drove a car here today. I parked the car all day, and I'll drive home. So my car is going to get used about an hour and a half out of the entire day, out of 24 hours. If I had subscribed to a network, 
that car could have come, picked me up, dropped me off, potentially picked other people up for the conference, run other errands, maybe do some deliveries for Amazon, and then schedule it to come back at 3 o'clock, right? So, so let's just, for argument's sake, say 10% of the cars on the planet are no longer needed because of the efficiency of this scenario. Uh, there's 80 million cars sold annually. 10% of 80 million is 8 million. That's Toyota. That's all of Toyota's suppliers. That's all of Toyota's dealers. That's all the body shops, right? That's all the insurance on those Toyotas. Because if you think Uber is going to buy insurance from Nationwide, no, they're going to self-insure. Is Google going to buy insurance from an insurance company? No, they're probably going to self-insure, right? So insurance is going to have a problem. Financing. I mean, we're talking millions of jobs. And I'm not saying the jobs are going to disappear because most of the time when di disruption happens, sets of jobs disappear, other jobs are created. And the main challenge is, are the people that lose their jobs on the left tooled to do the jobs on the right, right? So it's disruptive, it sucks for a lot of people, but it's still heavy, heavy disruption. Now from an indirect standpoint, I've got four pictures on here. I've got healthcare, parking garages, government, and police, okay? Um, let's talk healthcare. 20% of organ donors come from car accidents. It's estimated that a self-driving car network would save 1.5 million lives over 20 or 30 years. So I checked last night, I think there's about 120,000 people on the waiting list for various organs. What if 20% is gone because those accidents are no longer happening, right? We need to, we need to find other solutions to save those people's lives. Um, parking garages, I mean, you don't need to park if you don't have a car, right? Drops you off. So, you know, if you're in the real estate business, um, downtown and cities, it could be an opportunity because you're the one buying the parking garages and converting them to apartments. Um, or it could be a threat if there's all of a sudden this glut of property that's not used in the market and it could depress pricing for a while. Um, government, um, I'm trying to think of a statistic. It's something like $50 billion of state revenue in the U.S. comes from parking tickets, speeding tickets, and other automotive-related fines. That's a lot, right? So you think the self-driving car networks are going to speed, park illegally? Don't think so, right? So what are you going to do? Where is that money going to get made up? Because they're going to get their money somewhere. <clears throat> so let's talk about the airline industry. How is the airline industry going to be impacted by self-driving cars? And I'm going to use one of my favorite trips. I'm going to think about taking my family to Orlando for Disney World, since Duncan was talking about it this morning. If I'm going to decide, do I want to take a self-driving car to Orlando or I want to fly? Remember now, I'm not driving, right? So there's no stress of driving. I'm going to ride in an airplane or I'm going to ride in a car, right? Now, truth be told, I'm not the one making this decision. My wife or kids are. But if I were the one to make the decision, there's four factors. Travel time, round trip costs, comfort, and cargo. So let's, let's stack these guys head to head. So from a, from a travel time standpoint, it takes me an hour to get to the airport. You factor in an extra half hour because I got the family with me. You got to park. You got to get to the airport. You got to go through security. Then you wait. So maybe you're at the airport two hours. The flight to Orlando, if everything goes perfect, is an hour and a half. Then you got to get off the plane. You got to get your luggage. You got to get a rental car. You got to drive to the hotel. Six and a half hours. It's 467 miles from my house to the Wilderness Lodge. Um, you know what? We're, this is dream, so I'm going to say. Um, uh, the Swan or something, okay? So it's 467 miles to the Swan, right? You do that round trip, you use the federal reimbursement of 55 cents a mile, add 10 cents for profit for the subscription network, which might be a little low. 65 cents a mile times those miles, you know what, flip, is $600, is $600. So I've got six and a half hour trip, and I've got a $600 price. Now let's talk about flying. I think $300 a piece for a family of four for the, for the cost of the, the plane ticket, plus baggage fees, plus you got to pay for parking, et cetera, et cetera. I think 1200 is pretty fair. Um, so the self-driving car is roughly half price. Let's talk about comfort. Do we, do we need to talk about comfort? <laughs> All right, let's go. Um, and then do we need to talk about cargo? No. So, okay. So when we come to the next slide, um, so it's 301 self-driving car versus flight, in my mind, right? Um, in fact, the advantage is so high, I even wonder how much farther people would be willing to go in a self-driving car versus flying, right? 
So if you're an airline, what do you have to think about? Well, what percent of my customers are going to be disrupted? When are they going to be disrupted? As I mentioned, what about longer trips? And what are my options? You know, what Duncan would say this morning was, I'm not in the airline business. Maybe I'm in the event business or in the transportation business or in the experience business, right? What are they going to do? All right. So two other different scenarios real quickly um, in other industries. In my mind, if you think about the impact of self-driving cars, you think about the impact of artificial intelligence on the education industry, and you think about artificial intelligence and deep learning on healthcare, I'm disrupting somewhere around 40 to 70% of our economy, right, on these slides, right? In my example on the top, um, as I mentioned when I was at Teradata, I was fortunate to be able to watch computer vision, um, watch people's facial expressions, and adapt what they do on the computer to what you're doing. Um, to combine that with artificial intelligence and allow video to watch thousands of students learn math and then have the computer learn what works and what doesn't work and then adapt on the fly using machine learning or deep learning, I subscribe to you is a fundamental change and will have a huge impact and a positive one on the kids because they're going to learn math a lot faster. Um, but there's something like 3 million teachers in the US, 100 million teachers globally. Um, absent regulatory controls, uh, this could have a really big impact on the education industry. And the same thing on healthcare. The example I was reading the other day was on um, radiologists reading CT scans. Um, if you don't think uh, artificial intelligence is going to do one hell of a good job on reading CT scans, you know, you're kidding. Now, yeah, yeah, it's already better, and that's a good point. The, um, and the thing about it is when you read the companies that are doing the marketing brochures, they're talking about augmenting the radiologist. Nobody wants to talk about taking the person out of the process, but the reality is we need to take the person out of the process because computers aren't over-caffeinated, okay? They don't lose sleep. They don't have stress at home. They don't get tired, right? Am I saying that I'm going to have one computer read your CT scan and make a decision to do surgery? No, no. But am I saying maybe it'll read it five, seven, or a million times and then give a probability curve on what's going on with you and then send those results to a radiologist to confirm? Yeah. And you're going to live longer. You're going to be happier. You're going to spend less days in surgery. It's going to be cheaper. But it's going to impact the healthcare industry. All right, so this actually is the most important slide in the deck, okay? Everything else you can get from Duncan's talk this morning. So I want to give you guys a minute to read Dilbert. Can everyone read from the back? I'll go ahead and read it. So it's Dilbert, and is his name Dogbert? Okay, so Dilbert is packing to go out of town. He says, I'm supposed to shut down our mud delivery business, but I'm a highly trained engineer, so I will analyze their business model and fix it. Dogbert says, they deliver mud, to people who live in mud. Dobert, and Dilbert says, you have my attention. So <clears throat> I've worked with a lot of companies on these technologies. And they, in general, companies are very comfortable working around the periphery of their business, working on fraud, you know, working on you know, cutting a, a particular cost or doing a particular thing, right? They're very comfortable working incrementally with these disruptive technologies for a lot of the reasons that we talked about before because you have a quarterly statement that you have to make. You've got to hit your numbers, right? We spend $100 million on R&D, and for that $100 million, we want to know what innovation we're driving. We want to know what value we're driving. And we need to know quarter by quarter, and you better not be wrong, right? That is not what I'm talking about here, OK? I'm talking about the patient capital of the Amazons of the world. You've got to figure out how to focus on that core business model. Um, why do people really buy your product? Now, why do they really? I think Duncan's point this morning on the five whys was exactly right. I think a lot of people were fooling themselves um, for why people buy. And the reason why they're surprised with the disruption is because they don't see it coming. You have to separate the tangible from the intangible. So if you're in the mud delivery business and you own 90% of the mud, OK, probably that's not where the threat is going to come. But if you can separate out the experience of the tangible from the intangible, focus on the intangible, focus on the customer experience, focus on everything else around your business, OK? Um, Duncan had a lot of good ideas sitting in the living room, being with your customers. I worked for a site services company 
uh, about a year and a half, two years ago. Um, site services, for those that don't know, is porta potties. Okay, and they were worried about how technology is going to change the porta potty business. And I'll tell you this: if I can do Internet of Things on porta potties, I can do it on anything. Okay, um, but we spent. We worked 10 hours a day, and the first six hours of every day I worked with that client, I was on a truck, the porta potty truck, the one that you don't want to follow when you're in your car, right? And I was dressed like this, and I had my hard hat and my safety glasses, and when we get to a site, when the, when the driver would stop and start cleaning the porta potties or deliver one, I'd hop off and talk to the site supervisor about what their core needs were. Because let me tell you, they had to have a porta potty, but that wasn't what they thought about every day. They, they really couldn't care less. So I think Duncan's point there on getting in the living room is, is absolutely critical. But focus on that core, on that core of your business model. If you're in the hotel industry, don't fool yourself on why people stay at your hotel versus others. You know, how is the room that different from a brand perspective, right? And I'm not saying you're wrong, I'm just saying ask the five whys Get out, and, as Duncan said, in customers' living rooms and figure it out. Because the reason why Amazon and others have done well hopping from industry to industry to industry is because people get it wrong. People get it wrong. There's absolutely no reason why Amazon needed to be the leader in, in deliver of groceries to homes, right? There's no reason they had to buy Whole Foods. There were strategic options for other players. Um, this is a jumble of frameworks. Um, and it's a jumble of frameworks because I don't particularly care which one you use. Um, use any one you want. Um, going back to my traditional processes fail uh, message earlier, um, don't rely on frameworks and, and you know, figure it out yourselves. <clears throat> so when we get really serious about our business model, there's four primary methods that I'm going to talk to you about, about how to get your business model where it needs to be. Um, there's another one I didn't put on here, which is to lobby Congress and get laws passed. Right? I didn't want to talk about that one, but it, it's on here. So the first one is traditional M&A to gain scale. Um, there's going to be one big dumb company in every industry that makes it. So if you're the biggest, dumbest one out there, you're going to make it. It's not fun. It, you buy your competitors and lay a bunch of people off. It's miserable. You know? Um, you know, it's much more fun to disrupt the business model than have it disrupted to you. But if you do nothing else, buy your competitors and scale. The second one is hire to lock in key skills. And I've got slides on this in a minute. Um, M&A to lock in IP and know-how, got slides on that. Um, and then we'll talk about build creativity, learning, and speed. Um, but honestly, I'm going to repeat a lot of what uh, Duncan said, and, and I think said probably better this morning. So let's, let's jump. So I told you earlier that Tesla built its own chips, OK? So I want you to imagine a world for a moment, the world where most chip designers work for Intel, AMD, and NVIDIA, right? And you get up on Wednesday morning, you're an executive with one of these companies, um, and there's a text message on your cell phone when you wake up, and that text message says, AMD just lost an entire chip design team to Tesla. What do you think Intel did? What do you think NVIDIA did? Do you think there's a chance for another automotive company to go out and grab a chip team from one of those companies? Maybe. But do you think Tesla got the best one? Probably. You think they got it cheaper than the other guys do? Probably. It's one hell of a move. One hell of a move. Go one more slide. <clears throat> Tesla's also built into their business model a couple other things by being integrated and not relying on suppliers. They're able to fuse the technology through all aspects of the car, whereas almost all their competitors rely on suppliers. It's very difficult to weave these technologies and integrate them through all the components and something as complex of a car um, if you're doing it through suppliers. So that's a second strategic advantage I'd say Tesla has. And that's one of the reasons I think that there's so much patient capital in Tesla today. So there's a great example of hiring to lock in key talent. Uh, here's two examples of um, acquire, doing M&A to acquire key skills. So a couple of years ago, Amazon bought a robotics company. They bought the best robotics company for automating warehouses. The company was profitable selling robots to a lot of different industries. And then Amazon stopped selling the robots to everybody else and kept it for themselves. It's one hell of a move, right? I mean, there was a multi-year scramble to get up to speed. Um, and I'm not even sure anyone's really gotten there yet. 
Um, I know less about the McDonald's example, but I, I leave that one more as a question. So McDonald's didn't hire um, a consulting firm to come up with an AI strategy. They didn't hire somebody to build AI for them. They bought an AI company. What are they, what's McDonald's gonna do with that? Why, right? I don't have an answer for you. Um, I think it's an interesting move. Um, and one of the questions I put in the article is, why would McDonald's buy an AI company but you don't need to? Right? Okay. <clears throat> so on the creativity, learning, and speed perspective, um, a couple points. One I've already talked about. You need to separate. So Duncan used different terms this morning. The way I think about it is convergence and divergence. Okay? Everything about most companies converges on your existing business model. You optimize. You tune. You get tighter. You get faster. Okay? If you spend $100 million on new product development and R&D and everything, and it's all on convergence, that's where you're going to fail. You need to carve out a certain percentage. I would subscribe that it needs to be pretty high. And you need to focus in a divergent basis. That means option value. That means it's going to fail. That means you don't know what you're going to get this quarter. That means you don't know what you're going to get this year. You don't know what you're going to get in 18 months. You need to take a team. And Duncan talked about it really brilliantly this morning, um, a diverse team, a creative team. The people in your organization that kind of irk you because they're always asking those difficult questions, you're like, I just wish that guy would you know, just be quiet and get the job done, you know? Um, when I was at Accenture, we had a, a, an offering called Destroy Your Business. And we brought in a group of people to help you think about how your industry would be destroyed. Um, I'm sorry to say this was basically pre-internet, but I don't want to date myself. Um, we had a, a, a classical pianist from New York. We had an emergency, emergency room surgeon from Miami. Um, the smartest, youngest kids that were joining Accenture would do a stint on this team, but they'd never stay. Um, we had a guy who I swear was homeless because we'd always pick him up on a corner and take him to a client. Um, but I think he was a professor of sociology or something. Um, and we'd get these guys together um, for just a week. And they'd come up with some of the most insane ideas on business. Um, so you need to look in your organizations and find those creative people um, and then get them out of their comfort zone and let them fail and start experimenting. It's not about coming up with a strategy that's in a binder and then getting it approved and then going to execute it. Um, it's about an organic process, a divergent process. Um, you start, most of the time I do it, I start with seven people in an organization. It'll grow naturally on its own, and you've got to take them out of convergence. And if they come up with an idea that's convergent, like reducing fraud and credit card transactions or something, take the idea, document it on a page, give it to somebody else. Don't let your divergent team focus on convergence. The, um, <clears throat> let's jump one, uh, jump one other slide. So I love this quote. So, oh, and you know, I forgot at the beginning, I wanted to make clear, I don't own any stock in any of these companies. Um, I do have some biases. I buy something from Amazon Prime every day. Um, I have ordered, I have a $100 deposit on a Tesla truck, um, and I eat at McDonald's too frequently, but otherwise I've got no association <laughs> with these companies. Um, but I love this quote from Jeff. It says, day two companies make high quality decisions, but they make high quality decisions slowly. To keep the energy and diet, dynamism of day one, you have to somehow make high quality, high velocity decisions. Easy for startups and very challenging for large organizations. So this is the culture work. I have seen 99% of companies fail at this, which is why I recommend that you pull out a team and you make them divergent. You know, put them in another building if you have to. Um, you know, get them, get them out. I don't see companies really successful at doing this with 10,000 people. I see it start with seven and then grow from there and let it grow on its own. But this is the key from a culture standpoint. I'm not going to talk about it anymore because I think, I think Duncan knocked it out of the park this morning. So, one more slide. So that's all I got from a formal perspective. I appreciate your guys' time, and I'll leave the last five, seven minutes for questions. In 2018, I was uh, part of an electric vehicle startup that didn't make it, unfortunately. So I got a glimpse of autonomous vehicles. In your best estimate, I mean, the ride from Atlanta to Orlando, autonomous car, fascinating. 
what year is that going to happen in all reality? So I don't have a crystal ball better than anybody else, but I do believe um, kind of what Duncan talked about this morning, which is the, the 10 to 15 year. I don't think it's going to happen overnight. Um, so I think you're going to see examples of it. Um, the challenge for me with autonomous vehicles is not the networks and the self-driving. It's the mix of people driving and self-driving. And when there are accidents, most of them are going to be because of the people errors, um, and then people are going to blame the machines. But that's, I mean, it, it's going to take quite a while. The, the, the reason for our, so this article came out last fall, and the reason why we're saying people need to start now is because by the time companies understand how things are going to happen, it's going to be very hard and very expensive for them to adapt if they can adapt at all. Other questions? So you, you mentioned that don't let divergent uh, people run with the convergent idea, right? So can you elaborate a little bit more on it? So how do we get these people off their ideas? Because they own the ideas, right? It's very difficult for people to give away their ideas, especially in large organizations. So I've got two primary ideas that I've seen work. The qu so th the question was, um, how do you get people to give up ideas? Um, uh, the, the two ideas that I've seen work is when the divergent team has C-suite access. So they are constantly getting rewarded for being divergent. Um, and the second one is ceremonies. You make a big deal about it. You know, you write it down, you give them credit for the idea, and you make it ceremonial. And every company does that different. Um, I worked with one company that they leased a Tesla. And um, if you were the one that had the most recent idea that got moved out of the divergent team, that was your Tesla to drive for a month. And you got a special parking spot, and they would go out, and the ceremony was to walk out. And when people see everyone walking out with the keys and they had a bell that they rang, people would follow, and then they'd talk about the idea, they'd congratulate them, and the keys would be ha handed from one person to another. So, and that was, the, that was the reward. And, you know, if you think about it, for a large organization, how much would it cost to lease a Tesla? including insurance and everything. 20 grand a year? How many of these ideas are going to make more than 20 grand a year? All of them, right? Yeah. So, does that help? Awesome. Yep. Any other questions? We've got three or four minutes left. Yes. For longer range ideas or thoughts, do you have any comments about whether companies should try to at least think about the financial implications or the opportunity related to it. So we talked a lot about incrementalism, right? And looking yeah. at the numbers, but then looking forward and thinking about really disruptive ideas. Do you, do you advocate though for spending some time to think about what the financial implications of those things are? How do you sort of yeah. balance those two? Yeah, I think companies need to pick an amount that they want to do as an option investment and then they need to treat that money as a sunk cost. I would really discourage financial analytics around the divergent work stream. Um, the goals need to be learning. Um, the goals need to be culture. Um, no, I would not put financial. I would say this is an option, it's a sunk cost. We're gonna put $20 million a year on this and it's an option to save our business. And then, you know, make the convergent people more convergent to pay for it as hard as that sounds, but no. I, the goals need to be learning um, and speed. Yes? Yeah, I'll try to be loud. So, do you have a dedicated team for this? Because what I've seen in other companies is if it's a part-time gig, I'll grab this. If it's a part-time gig, a lot of times people will do this for a week and then they go away and you don't actually get outcomes, right? There's no way to measure outcomes. So have you seen teams succeed in that fashion or do they need to be fully dedicated to do this? Fully dedicated. Yeah. Fully dedicated. Um, the question was, can you do it with a part-time team? Um, obviously, the C-suite individuals can roll in and out. Um, you can reward other people by rolling them on the team for periods of time. Um, I've seen tons of models like that work, but the core, permanent, um, off-site. Um, and, and by the way, uh, a lot of people will do an innovation center and they'll have fancy furniture, um, coffee bar. I mean, do it if you want. 
Uh, I've not seen any correlation. You can, you can put them in the ugliest warehouse with no heat, and they're going to be better than if you leave them in the traditional space. So I think that's all the time we have uh, for this morning. So thank you for your time. Um, thank you.